you may have encountered Kohlberg's theory of morality. And similar to Turiel, the psychologist Kohlberg postulated that development through a series of stages of development of moral reasoning is what produces increasingly mature moral behavior. And these um, were mapped out, all these steps, very clearly, beginning with pre-conventional um, stage, where the reasoning reflects a concern about obedience and self-interest. This is followed by the conventional stage, where the reasoning reflects a concern about conforming, fitting in with the group, and law and order, punishment. The post-conventional stage in Kohlberg's model is when people demonstrate the capacity to understand the importance of social contracts, agreements, and oaths that hold people and society in mutual commitments. And it's the, the stage when you get the emergence of a principled conscience. Finally, um, in this stage, this is when a person can weigh competing moral commitments to social contracts, laws, and family members, and love, and core moral values and principles, such as do no harm. Interestingly, Kohlberg's stages of moral development have been found to be tangled up with political orientation, which puts into question their validity as measures of moral reasoning in general, as opposed to indicators of political ideals. First, Kohlberg's post-conventional morality stage was found to be more likely in liberals, suggesting principal conscience is either not a conservative phenomenon or this measure can't really tell us about it. Suggesting the latter, when conservative students who typically got lower scores than liberals were told to respond like a left-winger, um, their responses were at the level of left-wing students' responses at that higher stage. Critics saw these results and they said, that final stage of moral development in this model might be vacuous, and perhaps this entire model is invalid if the instrument suggests that our conservative friend, family, neighbors do not have morally legitimate and honorable moral reasoning taking place, or they regularly function using some kind of immature moral development. So the characterization of opt optimal moral reasoning was just not working. This, of course, was not every psychologist's view, um, but some psychologists did take these findings into account. And they really pushed um, psychologists even further to ask the question, should the moral domain actually be broadened? If the domains of harm and fairness do not encompass all the morally important domains of human beings' lives, or do not involve all the modes of moral cognition that are relevant to people, does this mean we should make morality fit the people's concerns? Well, if we widen this moral domain, this means moving beyond experimental materials that only tell us about harm um, and views about violating rights and, and killing, for example. And it means also that we need to reinforce the, co the conceptual validity of our models of morality by pursuing descriptive research. We need to simply observe what people say is relevant to morality to them without preconceptions, what is actually out there. The idea that we, we might want to broaden the moral domain, it's inspired a huge endeavor to understand morality beyond educated liberal Westerners and has involved lots of new research with a range of participants, some of, of whom showed interesting patterns of responses about what counts as moral. People in a variety of groups, including low SES, US and Brazilian citizens and US conservatives, were found to be more likely to legitimize moral concerns beyond harm and fairness, including loyalty to their group and country, um, concern about hierarchy and, and making sure they stay in the right role, 
um, and concern about purity and sanctity. One conservative participant asked to define morality in an early descriptive study noted, morality is having a system that protects the social institutions of family, community, and country. As we'll see in more detail later, there was a case to be made for research um, that aims to broaden the moral domain. Jonathan Haidt proposed that broadening the moral domain can not only better capture people's understandings of right and wrong, but it can also highlight why we see those apparent striking contradictions that we covered at the very beginning of this lecture, that people are selfish yet morally motivated, and that moral motivation is universal yet has cultural variability. He approached this research project with th four principles in mind, which we're gonna take in turn. First, intuitive primacy. Second, motivated moral reasoning. Uh, third, morality for the group. And fourth, morality beyond harm and fairness. Beginning with the first principle, intuitive primacy. This is a key part of Haidt's theory it's a social intuitionist model. This means that he thinks our moral judgments come from a combination of events. First, an initial automatic effective intuition. Second, a controlled reasoning process that comes after that. When this reasoning process is applied to that effective reaction, such as that that's disgust or anger, this leads to jug judgments that reflect post hoc moral reasoning. Post hoc moral reasoning is the search for evidence to support some initial intuitive reaction. This way of thinking about moral judgment underscores the importance of the influence of our implicit affective triggers. It fits with a view of human psychology that Haidt is really known for, likening human psychology to a rider and an elephant. The elephant is intuition or emotion, doing the work most of the time without much intervention, just pounding along. And then the rider, reason, it can direct that elephant and it does sometimes, but by and large, intuition, that massive strong animal is in charge. So where's the evidence for this? Um, Haidt's social intuition, intuitionist model suggests that people engage in an initial automatic process of moral evaluation. They intuitively react. They have an effective response, and it's not necessarily registered in consciousness. He cites as evidence a test of moral dumbfounding, this idea that people sometimes morally judge events based on criteria they simply cannot access. For example, People, when asked if incest is morally wrong, will say, yes, it is. But when asked to explain when it is wrong, they typically don't have the ability to, to have a clear reason. So some cite its potential for harm to future offspring if they were to be born. But even when they're given information that makes such concerns irrelevant, such as both parties not having the capacity to have children or... Um, they get information about their relationship being safe, loving, and consensual. People still say it's wrong. And when asked why, I don't know, it's just wrong. And that um, was deemed moral dumbfounding. Other researchers took the role of intuition and moral judgment further. In research by Cushman and colleagues, the researchers investigated the role of three components of harmful acts and how people judge those acts. The components were the action itself, the intention of the actor, and whether there was contact made between the actor and the affected person. The researchers took each of these components and varied it in different vignettes about harm. For example, one harmful event would be intentional and the same event was tested um, with a slight tweak that made it not intentional. They had people make moral permissibility judgments about all the vignettes. 
How morally permissible was this? They were asked to justify their judgments using free text response. So in a more open-ended question, um, they supplied their answer to why they thought it was morally permissible or not. And these justifications were then coded for their relevance to those three components, intentions, the harmful action, or the presence of physical contact. For example, a participant might justify a moral permissibility rating by writing something like, it was wrong because people shouldn't be hitting each other like that. What they found when they coded all the responses was that participants actually did not refer to intentionality when justifying their permissibility ratings very often. This went under the radar. They did reference the other two principles, um, the action and whether there was physical contact. However, their intentionality judgments, um, the difference in intentionality, was hugely important to their moral permissibility judgments. Whether it was intentional or not significantly predicted moral permissibility judgments, but these were largely missed. 75% of justifications did not mention them. So the results indicate that participants rely on intuitions about the intentionality of actors, whether they meant to do it or not, but they don't explicitly acknowledge this information, these intuitions, when making their moral judgments. Intuitions um, about being intentional or not may not be an emotional factor, but they represent an implicit intuitive psychological factor that influences judgments that we like to think are reason-based, 